Okay, so welcome to this afternoon session. Um, this morning we saw some fundamentals of uh, some basics of uh, stochastic geometry um, and how different models can actually be useful in modeling wireless networks. So this afternoon we are going to see an example uh, of such an application um, I've been working on with, with my team in, in Dublin. So let's to give an idea of um, basically what we have been doing um, in the context of dense cell deployment. So we started to look in the beginning to transmit power per cell so that we can achieve a linear error spectral efficiency gain. So there are results that basically mention that if you increase the density of a network, you achieve a linear uh, area spectral efficiency gain. and um, this is actually true if you have a single slow path loss model, okay? And uh, what we investigated in the beginning was the transmit power, the minimum transmit power that you need per base station so that you achieve this linear area spectral efficiency increase with the density. So we have a, a publication on that. And then basically you can also show in this condition of a simplified path loss model that you can actually save um, the total transmit power, you can reduce the total transmit power in the network, increasing the density, okay? Um, and then you can also show that you actually have an asymptotic behavior of the energy efficiency, which is throughput divided by the total power you transmit uh, in your network. So this, this basically energy efficiency tends to reach a plateau with the density, but it doesn't decrease. Now this is a consequence of the propagation model being simple. Um, so what we're going to see today, also helped by stochastic geometry, is that if you change the assumption on the propagation model and you start to have a more realistic one, uh, which uh, has uh, basically uh, allows for some probability to be in line of sight, to, to be in line of sight with some probability and to be in non-line of sight with some other probability, which is the complement of the former probability, then you get results that are actually less optimistic and probably closer to the real situation. Okay. So, um, again, recalling stochastic geometry in, in one or two minutes. So, we, we saw basically it is a mathematical tool. It comes from <coughs> uh, math. Okay, uh, from geometry, so basically it is a version of geometry which has a, a stochasticity, right? So we, you don't have things like an absolute distance, but everything is probabilistic in that sense. Mm -hmm. And the same with um, position of points, right? So it's, it is a, a random version of geometry if you want. Um, it does allow in our uh, field to basically compute uh, the probabilistic distribution of a few metrics of interest um, to our network. So SINR, coverage, rate, area spectral efficiency, they can all be written uh, in terms of uh, a probabilistic um, distribution, which depends again on the assumptions you make on, on, the, on the specific uh, model the characterizing the deployment. Um, now, this is true for what we did, but it's not the only thing you can do as we saw this morning. So in, in we assume the base stations to be spatially distributed according to a spatial Poisson point process. Okay? We took the simplest uh, possible approach in terms of modeling and um, you know, we worked with that. So the pros and cons in general of uh, stochastic geometry, or at least of the part of stochastic geometry we used, um, are, are as follows. So the, the on the plus side, we have uh, the possibility to write an analytical expression for network metrics. Uh, now, analytical expression doesn't necessarily mean it is in closed form. It just means we have an equation. But then it could be that to solve, uh, to find an actual value to that equation, you might need to use numerical uh, techniques, right? To integrate an integral, for example, that you, you don't know the primitive for. 
the nice thing about having an analytical expression, that's true for any uh, analytical approach, not just for stochastic geometry, is that if you make sure you're in that um, setup with those um, assumptions, you don't need to run simulations ever anymore, right? So the, the good thing is that you are you're done with simulations, uh, provided that you are within that context. Then you just simply have to change the parameters in the formula and you get the value, right? That's the good thing about the analytical approach. Uh, but you have to be exactly in those, uh, you know, situation. Otherwise, you start to lose um, uh, precision, right? So you can still use a formula, as l uh, that formula as long as the real uh, situation is not that different than what you assumed when you derived uh, the formula. Otherwise, you start to become imprecise. Um, and of course, it does give network uh, insight on network design, right? Uh, it, it can tell you, for example, uh, things about uh, what density is best to use, and it's uh, it's a consequence of this uh, d um, intensity parameter, right? That's probably the main advantage in terms of insight in on network design. Uh, we saw the we, we will see the version where you actually model with uh, stochastic geometry the base station deployment, but there are other works that focus on the user side or more on traffic side. So it's, it's not the end of it, what we do, of course. There are, there are other works focusing on different aspects of the network. Um, the, the, um, the problems, at least of uh, what we could see when using spatial Poisson point process, that uh, this kind of deployment model underestimates the performance of a real network. Um, in a sense, it lies on the other extreme of the of the um, uh, spectrum f for um, as compared to um, regular deployments. So when you use the Sunicom or say a regular square grid kind of deployment, you will tend to overestimate the performance of the network. So say throughput, you, you will tend to, s to think that throughput is higher than what it actually is. So it's kind of best case scenario. Um, SPPP is um, on the other extreme of the scale, so it's kind of underestimating the performance. It's kind of worst case scenario. So if you really have to choose and you have to design a network, it's probably a wiser idea to choose the worst case scenario, right? As, as we know in engineering, it's normally the, the best approach to avoid surprises when you actually run the network, right? Uh, another problem which we, we are aware by now uh, from this morning's lecture is that uh, the correlation among points is hard to capture, okay? It's, it's, this is meant to be uh, a, a, a model where you have different basically regions. Within this region, the points are uh, distributed uh, in, a, in a random way and then different regions that are distinct have nothing to do with each other. So it's very difficult with this model to actually take into account the correlation and you need something else. You need other kind of models like the cox uh, Gaussian model, for example, to, to actually take that into account, okay? So we have to be aware of the limitations uh, when we use a model, of course. Um, so what we do, uh, basically you will um, come up with um, you know a certain Poisson point process uh, distribution of the different cells and then you will pick uh, what we call a typical user it's kind of you know uh, I don't think it's a very formal definition but you normally like pick one user which is representative of the set and and you you do your math based on that normally you place this typical user in the origin actually um, so, other things about the u u uh, usefulness of stochastic geometry when analyzing cellular networks. Um, it, it is a reasonable fit uh, with real deployments, more reasonable than uh, uh, the, the usual honeycomb or, you know, very regular uh, deployments which we used to assume in the past. Um, you can get close form solutions for the coverage probability, which is nice. Um, and definitely you can get some system-wide performance characterization. So we are going to see a few metrics uh, that actually um, characterize the network performance, okay? So there are some good points to go for it. Uh, 
Um, yes. So basically, you, you, I think you know, in the um, in the cases we have been uh, considering, no. Right, right. In general, you don't you don't have it. I mean, you you have to go for probably numerical integration, right? So, um, and yeah, so you're right. I mean, so it is it is not always true. What is always true though is that you can get an expression, right? An expression is there. Now this actually is a legacy thing. I ah, know. Wait, no. But it's probably coming from that presentation, so it's okay. Uh, so yeah. So de depending actually on the. Um, on the values of, of parameters for, for example, the propagation, right? You have the, the closed form available or not, but you, you will, in general, have an expression, okay? So which, uh, if you apply a standard numerical in techniques, you, you will be able to get a value at least. Hmm? It's not as beautiful as an expression, but still, it's, it's not too bad. Um, so what we did in this work, um, actually is building on top of uh, another uh, model which is available in the literature from Andrew's group okay and we introduced basically the performance uh, of uh, we studied the performance of a network introducing the possibility to be either in line of sight or non line of sight so we did we did extend this uh, general model proposed in this paper in, in 2011 to the case of LOS and LOS uh, propagation we're going back to what do you mean exactly by this? Um, so what happens uh, when you assume actually um, a simple single slope path loss model? So just to uh, clarify, when, when we mean, when we say single slope path loss model, model is because of the expression um, of, the, um, of the path loss. So if you write things in a, in a logarithmic, uh, fashion, you get actually the the exponent, the path loss attenuation exponent becomes uh, basically something that multiplies this, right? So it will tell you uh, practically the um, angular coefficient of a line, right? If you plot things against the logarithm of something, this uh, is like saying a x, right? If you call x the logarithm of something else. It's, uh, you can represent things uh, as a line, okay? So in this case, uh, in a logarithmic plot, this will look like a straight line, yeah? So if you just have one uh, value for this uh, coefficient, you talk about single slope path loss model, okay? Um, now, a more realistic way to model the path loss is to introduce a probabilistic uh, situation where with some probability, which uh, depends on the distance, you will be in line of sight, and with the, with the probability equal to one minus that probability, you will be in non-line of sight. This is a model actually proposed by 3SVP for uh, HATNET uh, scenarios. Um, so, and, you know, we, we, we basically adopted that. I'm going back to this. Okay. There are some specific problems to solve to extend um, this model proposed by Andrews to the line of sight, non line of sight uh, situation. We are going back to that. Um, so, going back to what I was saying, uh, if you have um, a single slope path loss model, so the simple version, not the 3GBP model version, uh, there are some things which uh, are happening and are not really very convincing. Um, for example, the outage doesn't depend on the density. No matter how, densi how densely you deploy, the outage is a, is a line. It's a horizontal line. So it's a constant, which doesn't make too much sense because if you increase the density too much, you would expect interference to play a role, right? At some point, this will be too many transmitters and cannot be that you are never below a certain SINR level, right? SINR will be impacted because interference will will go up. So mm, it's clearly like uh, a consequence of the model. So the model is not wrong, okay? The model o is okay for some things, but for some other things like the outage doesn't work. So this is when the model breaks down and probably if you're interested, if you're not interested in the outage, fine, you can live with a single slope path loss model. But if you're interested in the outage, then you have to change that. So you see, the model is not good or bad. The model has to suit your purpose. If it doesn't, you change it, 
OK, that's it. Um, and s same thing with spectral efficiency, which is, again, a horizontal line. Doesn't depend on density. It's, again, intuitively doesn't seem very satisfactory, right? Should, you, should, you would expect some spectral efficiency change. I'm not saying ev ev average spectral efficiency. I'm saying just the spectral efficiency, bits per second per hertz. So if you get closer and closer to your um, to your um, the receiver, what you would expect is that for the same bandwidth, you should get a higher throughput, right? And uh, well, up to some point, then interference kicks in. But you would expect some regions where things change, right? Uh, within some distances like that, beyond the distance like that, but not. You would not expect that things are monotonically uh, the same, right? Like constant. So. Even intuitively, this doesn't satisfy us, and that was the main motivation to actually uh, chase, uh, you know, to change the model. Uh, another thing you we will notice: so this is this is not going to be the case anymore when you complicate the path loss model. So if you start to have a line of sight, non line of sight probabilistic model, these things won't be the case anymore. We are going to see how they look like. Um, the area spectral efficiency gain is no longer linear with the cell density. But it will, will have some different uh, regions uh, in terms of the density. So at low cell densities, it will become super linear, even. And then the high cell densities will become sublinear. So it is more what I was saying before. You would expect things cha that change quite radically, even depending on the density. You would not expect things to be either very linear or constant. You know, uh, My experience, even working with MIMO, is that this, uh, when, when it looks too nice and too smooth, the curve, there is something fishy there. And it's likely the consequence of the model, OK? Which, again, is not too bad, uh, as long as you acknowledge that there are some um, validity uh, limitations of your model, right? There is no model that will work forever for, for everything, OK? So you will have to be aware of that. Okay. Yes. With the with the cell density, so increasing the cell density, we are going to see that these are not a horizontal line. If you have a model where you have only one slope for the path loss, so if, if we increase density, we are increasing the efficiency. Uh, we are going to see it. Uh, we are going. Uh, it, it's going to be not a constant. Okay. In uh, in uh, we are going to see it. For example, in terms of the outheads, it it changes quite a bit. Okay. Um, Let's see. Like uh, let's see if I have a result. Uh, it's not linear at all. It's more of a bell shape. Okay, I'm going back. Uh, the main message here, um, we are going back to that, but the main message in this slide is that they are not constant at all. Actually, nothing could be further from the truth, okay? And even the ASA, ASC gain is not really. So always be very dubious as a scientist when you see things that look too nice. If you have a practical system, it's never the case. Okay, there is probably it's like the model you are playing with. It's a bit too simple. Hmm? Okay. Yes. 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 I think, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know if you remember, there was a slide from Professor Da Silva. He was actually checking, uh, they were checking in his group uh, how uh, different stochastic geometry model would match uh, um, a real deployment. So, I mean, this you don't really need operator collaboration for this. You do need operator collaboration when you want traffic data, right? You need, I mean, th they are the ones running the network, but the position of base stations, I mean, of the... Um, Big ones, okay. The small ones, that's another story. But the position of macro base stations are available on online. Check, I mean, you there's definitely, I'm pretty sure there's a database in India too where you can find that they have to be public, I think. Okay, they have to tell you the probably you can get some information about the class 3G, 4G, right? Uh, power, probably. Uh, normally, you have like the urban case and then the suburban case, they have different powers. Probably in the in the urban in the rural case, the power might be higher because they have to cover a larger area, right? So these things are available, I think, in general. So you you could uh, check. I think that if they in Ireland they did check it in the Dublin region in in my center, 
and they found that um, um, uh, there were a few, like definitely the, say, kind of honeycomb deployment, way off the, the scale, as we would expect, nothing to do with the real situation. Uh, the SPPPP is slightly better, but really not matching too well. Uh, but when you go into other things, like uh, I, I don't exactly recollect which model it was. It was a better match, probably the uh, Cox uh, Gaussian model. It started to resemble somewhat the real picture, maybe not exactly, but you know, I even um, they might have done some quantitative uh, comparison, right? Some sort of ma matching. But even visually, you could see that getting a model which is more in a sense, uh, it's encompassing more and more the wireless propagation effects and so on, you get closer to a real match, okay? So I think this sentence, uh, uh, reasonable means that. So, okay, depending on what you pick, you might get actually fairly close or, you know. But all of these models are going to be, a, I think, a more reasonable um, representation of the actual deployments than what we are used to, then this regular, I think that's true. Uh, even if you take SPPP, it's still better than, you know, just for the reason maybe that you are doing a, um, a worst case scenario representation, which is a wiser idea than a best case scenario. But the more you complicate your model, the more you get close to, to actually the, the, the real uh, deployment, yeah. So there are some, some studies. I think, I mean, if you don't focus on traffic or users, which is more difficult because of demand, traffic demand, and mobility, I think it's, it's possible, I mean, to get the data from, you know, a national database and just do some matching. I don't think it should be a big deal. Once you have your, let's say, the, the points from the database, which is the real deployment, then you, you have your own, and then you kind of, you might find out the minimum square error of the distance, I don't know, but it shouldn't be a big deal, I think, yeah. Yes. Yes. Suppose I want to calculate the SNR distribution of yes. these two models. Yes. So if I need, if I go get this real data. Yes. So I can say that it is more or less matching with the propagation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then the yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I, I mean, SNR or not, eventually what you're really dealing with here is the position of things. Okay. So and uh, probably. I don't know if you know to to get something else, you would need to take measurements about the actual, you know, if you want a CNR, you need the channel. So I think it's not too difficult to do a, a matching with the positions. But to do something beyond this, like what you're saying, is more complicated, I think. Because you, you, de you, you see, you can have your own CNR model, but the real situation, the only way you could double check that is to take measurements. That, and so you would have to have a kind of limited area, would be fairly complex to do, I, I would imagine, okay, yeah. But yeah, possibly feasible, I think. I'm not sure that measured data is there any available. I'm not aware of. I would be surprised if there is too much available. It doesn't look very simple thing. Probably people that do channel characterization, stuff like this, because normally you don't do that, right? Unless you want to model the channel. I think just to verify whether your model is correct or not would be too much of a trouble, right? But uh, um, yeah. Depends on you know the resources you have and you know and the interest. Okay, so the the system model we we use uh, it is actually small cell based. So we have a network of small cells. Uh, the base stations are distributed according to SPPP, uh, and the UEs the user equipments are distributed uniformly. Um, we also assume that the reuse is one, which means all base stations transmit over the same band B. That's a big assumption, okay? So you can, of course, argue that's not optimal in any way, and we agree. So in fact, one of the works that should be done beyond what we did is actually the, the MAC resource allocation aspects. Uh, that's definitely very, very important, especially in the light of what I'm going to show about outage, okay? Which is crap at some point. So you do need to do something about um, the way you, you manage the spectrum between cells. Anyway, we didn't do that. Um, and uh, same goes with uh, power control. So we did uh, assume the same power uh, to be transmitted from all base stations, okay? 
Again, you might argue that's not realistic. I, I can't even agree with that, but you know, you have to start somewhere. So we took some simple assumptions just to, to have a feeling how the math looks like. Um, by the way, it's not too bad an assumption in terms of um, power to be the same for all base stations uh, in LTE because LTE assumes, as far as I know, uplink power control. It doesn't need, as far as I know, power control in downlink. Okay, so probably not too bad as an assumption anyway. So additional assumptions we have, which again you can argue, and I can uh, I can agree with that, but you know you have to you have to basically start somewhere. So the network is fully loaded, which simply means that there are no base stations that are inactive. Okay, so we have at least one user per base station. Now where this would break down, and we do have some results on that. I'm just not showing them in this course. Would be the part three of this roadmap where you go towards what we call ultra dense networks where you have many more uh, base stations than users and in that case uh, as i said before in this course you kind of reverse the scheduling problem you have to pick which base station to to serve uh, should serve your user rather than picking which users you should serve with your base station right it's kind of reversed uh, so we do have some results on that but i won't show them in this course as far as I'm aware, we have at least a pa there's a paper under review, or at least being prepared. But um, we do have an archive version of more or less the overall picture, an archive uh, paper. So if you're interested, you can check it out. Um, so we are not in that situation anyway of ultra dense networks yet in this case. So we just say, okay, every base station will have a user to serve. Full buffer traffic simply means that the base station always has something to transmit to at least one user, and it will always use all the resources available. Okay, so it won't be the case where because of li traffic limitation, we will need uh, less bandwidth. For example, like what you're given, you use it all. Hmm? Um, now there is a reason behind uh, this. It's like we didn't want to be to have the results uh, skewed by uh, lack of traffic. Okay, because we want us to see in, in some setup, okay, what what the uh, basic metrics of interest of uh, to, to to characterize the network looks lo look like. So we didn't want to say, for example, I don't know, um, spectrum efficiency is low, is because we are not transmitting enough. You see my point. So we don't want that we're not interested at the moment in that. Uh, of course, at some point, you could complicate the traffic model and so on, but we just didn't want to have any external noise so to speak in our results okay um, and very reasonable assumption user connects uh, to the base station providing the strongest signal so, you know, this, this is reasonable um, now we we shouldn't be too surprised by these things because we saw the the, gen the, the basic framework of SPPP this morning so uh, the number of points over a given area so this is a typo has a Poisson distribution with the parameter uh, lambda times the, the measure of the area right, that we saw this morning. And lambda is simply the density of base stations per area. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you fix the number of points, given the number of points is n, each point will be uniformly distributed over, over the area. Okay? That's another fact we have to be aware of uh, when using SPPP. So, even visually, so what you get uh, when you have basically, I don't think I showed this kind of figures this morning, so that's how it looks like. Okay, that's uh, an SPPPP. So in principle, very similar to this Voronoi tessellation, right, at least visually. Um, so in a square grid situation, you see everything is very regular. And normally, either, either we have this uh, <coughs> square thing or more normally the hexagonal thing, the honeycomb, but it's like that. So you do a very regular grid of, of uh, points when you represent the positions of the base stations. But assuming an SPPP distribution, you get something very different. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that this is, uh, it, it might be as distant from the reality as this. But this is clearly less positive in the assumptions. So that's why I'm saying that this is kind of an un uh, over, uh, underestimation of the network performance this is an overestimation. This is too nice to be the case. This might be too bad, okay, but uh, it's, not, it's not as nice at least. Hmm? Yes? Uh, 
Uh, good question. Uh, there is actually this uh, stream of work uh, on ultra dense networks, and they simply assume, you know, um, well, one thing it could be that they are simply available. Okay, you have they become so cheap and so omnipresent that you you, you have them. Okay, it could be like for example, say a situation where you have an optical bus connecting. Could be, could be, th could be that. Okay, but uh, regardless of the technology, I think people are. Uh, considering scenarios where basically you want a very continuous and very good capability service okay so and possibly I mean if already now when you have an access point which is a sh kind of shorter range communication you get good performance imagine if you would be just blanketing the room right you would have a crazy good performance and some other things you might actually need to assume a, a, d a denser deployment because of propagation limitation like millimeter wave. Um, the advances also in, in um, on the optical side, right? Th this basically still maybe some time to go, but I read of people uh, mentioning about these optical buses really in a capillary way reaching different points and then you could have an antenna port every meter or so. I mean, so there are a few trends, including the, the needs in terms of traffic that are leading towards this ultra dense network. So I think cost is probably a very important thing. Things are getting cheaper, right? Um, I'm not sure, you know, when this will really hit the market, but there are indications that, uh, you know, the density is, is definitely increasing. So I think compared to the scenarios considering um, 4G, like the satnet with maybe a few picocell per area already with the uh, you know uh, spreading of uh, phantom cells we are moving in that direction now of course there's a forecast you know might actually not happen to the extent I'm saying but uh, there are some motivations to go towards um, having more base stations uh, than than users okay um, another thing could be simply um, that you know you have um, other machines also connecting so you have also start to think you know that 5g is not just about uh, the smartphones right so uh, you could have a case where i mean call it a receiver rather than you know a person with a mobile phone you could potentially have uh, you know really uh, uh, you know the need uh, the possibility to have many many uh, you know uh, access points and so on so I don't think uh, you know it's unreasonable to consider that, but it's one possibility. Okay, so there are situations possibly where you won't need that uh, that thing. Uh, I'm thinking more probably things like where you have um, uh, some immersive reality thing, right? Virtual reality where you have some experience in certain area, or you know. Uh, uh I think you really, I mean, to envision the need for that, you really either it's very cheap and easy to do, or the traffic requirements are crazy, in a sense, okay, at least compared to what we're used today. Otherwise, probably there is no point, okay, so it's not necessarily. I think, you know, if you actually, if you, if you have su such a dense environment, it's probably not good. So you will need to do some adjustment in terms of the channels you use. I don't think, though, you can go for this traditional frequency reuse. It will be probably much more of a self-organizing frequency allocation. So you will have to to sense, you know, what channels are available and pick them on the fly. Um, yeah. So I think it's one possibility, but it's not that it's you know everything will be that way. It, it depends on the need and whether you know you have a good backhaul and whether it's cheap. And otherwise, I don't see the point. It's not that everything is going to be ultra dense networks. It's it's a possibility. Okay. Any other question? No. Okay. Um, this more or less we covered. Now, we already went through this uh, just to basically uh, recall um, the 3GPP model for we consider here a pico cell scenario. Now again, we we are adopting a pico cell channel model for a small cell possibly dense small cell environment. So again, you might argue whether it's the right model. I think it's a decent uh, assumption, but you know, you, you could work on channel model and come up with better models for, you know, other deployments and that, that's, that's okay. 
I, I agree with that. Okay, so you do have this uh, probability, which actually uh, it is a function which leads to nice tractability, and it's not the only possibility. You could even get rid of the two-year or the actual. I think I might be able to show you what they actually use in 3GPP, uh, which is not these. if I find it so they use another function which is this guy yeah so that's the function they use in uh, in 3GPP so again this uh, you see the, the uh, line of sight probability which is this PL will go down with the distance right will decrease which makes sense the more far away you are the less likely you will be in line of sight correct um, think it makes sense um, now the problem with this expression uh, even by the look of it it's very nasty so we it, it didn't really suit very much the, the needs to have a nice uh, analytical tractation so we got rid of this and we found another um, expression which uh, actually looks uh, nicer and leads to nicer math, which is this. Now, we didn't want just to be arbitrarily saying that's the function we picked, but we tried to match it with, um, with um, the 3 gpp expression. So the 3 gpp model is this blue curve. And we picked, for example, I mean, we did some matching with uh, certain parameter L. I will explain to you what L is in a sec. And it's not that far off, okay? So just to say, okay, we tried somehow to validate, but you know, you can argue all the day whether you know this is uh, the right channel model and so on. I think we wanted something realistic, more or less, and c that could lead to some mathematical tractability. But you can improve on that. I I agree with that. Now, this L parameter, it's basically telling how. Um, uh, sparse is the environment in terms of scatterers so what it means basically is that uh, if L increases say in this case under 20 meters um, the propagation is likely to be line of sight at large longer distances okay because simply you have less hurdles between the transmitter and the receiver so this L, L basically increasing L would mean a situation where it looks more and more like a desert in a sense, right? You have nothing scattering the transmission. On the other hand, if you decrease L and it goes to lower values, you would have a situation which is more and more cluttered, right? You would have things that actually might op uh, uh, obstacle, right, the, um, the transmission. So, of course, that uh, you can play with that and, in a sense, uh, change the environment you are testing, okay? And uh, so, of course, if the environment is very cluttered, it will take little in terms of distance before the it drops, uh, the probability of being in line of sight drops, right? Because there are many that actually make it go wrong. On the other hand, if you have a sparse environment, when things, uh, you don't have too many scatterers, then it's, uh, it's unlikely that things will go wrong, at least for some distance, right? So it kind of shifts the curves to the right. So this has to show how the um, uh, path loss looks like. Okay, everything is uh, logarithmic here. So you have in a single slope path loss model, which I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, you have this red curve. And then only considering the line of sight piece of the model, I of this double slope model, that's the curve. And then the non-line of sight is the green one. And of course, the average one, which you get by averaging over this probability distribution, very simple one, right? Bernoulli-like, yeah? Uh, you get basically, yeah, kind of envelope, right, of the thing. Any question? OK, now, uh, don't want to go into too many details. Just to give an idea of the process, OK, we use to come up with uh, expressions. So we want, uh, I mean, in the main, we want the probability of a CNR being higher than some uh, value. So the probability of not being in outage, basically, right? Um, now, the, you can do this by taking an expectation over a distance. And then you will have, basically, to integrate over 
all possible distances and you will have to take into account the um, uh, probability distribution function um, of, of the distance to the serving base station. So you have few pieces here. So first of all, uh, you have the um, complementary CDF, right? So when you calculate the probability of, of a variable, a random variable being less than something, that's the CDF. Yes. So in well, well, this is simply, you know, like it tells that you you span between these two, and then you're saying compared to the red one, I guess. Yeah, yeah, of course, it's an average, right? So, but you 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 have both, right? You have uh, you have in this, I mean. No, but you see, if you don't have the average, then it's always going to be the green one, right? So the if you just have no line of sight, it's that's what you get. So it's very similar to what you get with single slope, with the problems of single slope also, right? So you do need both. You do need line of sight and no line of sight. Okay, so it's, that's 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 the, the thing of the model. Otherwise, you end up in a in a single slope model again. Doesn't matter whether you call it no line of sight. Okay, you will have some difference, but you will end up likely. I don't think we tried this, but it will you will likely end up with the same problems of constant. Constant spectral efficiency. So you know, you have to consider that you could, you could calculate if, say, everything was fixed. You're right, but the distances are probabilistic here, correct? The points, uh, you know, uh, the base stations, and even like the users, everything is probabilistic here, right? So you do have to to use to take basically uh, expectations to get something out of it. You agree? So because you see that the, in the normal deployment, you say the distance is fixed. But here, it's really a random process itself, right? Yeah. Okay, that's a personal choice. I think, you know, we, we, yeah, we took the distance approach. Yeah. So, so your question was whether you can do it with, uh, no. no, why we pick yeah. it? Yes. Yes. Okay, so basically you have to condition on the distance. And you need a few things then. You need the uh, uh, complementary CDF, right? So CDF is when you calculate the probability of a random variable being less than something. CCDF is the one minus that, which is the probability of the random variable being bigger than that something, of course. Um, and you condition this based on a certain distance, right? Then you need the PDF um, of the distance R to the serving base station, okay? And eventually, you need to average over all possible distances, yeah? And then you end up with your uh, probability of not being in outage, basically. Uh, we do have uh, expressions, I don't know if I show them here. Uh, there is actually um, up to some point, but you do need uh, numerical integration in the end. Okay, and uh, it's not so surprising because you know when you start to see things that are probabilistic and so on, it's uh, it's not probably so easy to come up with uh, with close form. But the best we could do is um, to come up basically with uh, with an expression which you can numerically integrate. Okay, so it's semi-analytical. In nature, yeah. Okay. Um, now the the problems are twofold. The problem is twofold. So you do have basically base stations that are in line of sight, uh, and base stations that are in non line of sight, um, and they are subject to different propagation patterns as function of the distance, right? Because we have this uh, situation here. Okay. And um, what happens, it's uh, basically you have two sets of base station. One that follows some propagation, right? So we have to take that into account because basically what we assume is not the 
closest is the strongest, right? So we have to take that into account in the model. Um, so to take into account the first uh, problem, which is um, like we have two sets basically of points of base station, so we will have um, a process containing the base station in line of sight, which we call phi L, and has a density of uh, lambda times the probability, uh, the um, probability, right, to be in line of sight, which goes with the distance to the certain base station, and then another process, which is phi and L, uh, containing the base stations that are in non line of sight, which has a density which is lambda, so again, the homogeneous um, Poisson rate parameter times the dual of this probability, right? The complement, 1 minus PL. Um, these two processes are independent and uh, as we know from uh, stochastic geometry, in this case the union is an SPPP with density lambda because we just sum these two things. This is again something that shouldn't be sound into um, uh, strange to you if you remember what happened with Poisson processes in time, right? It's the same thing. So if you have a Poisson process with some uh, rate basically and then in other independent one with another rate the the um, the union, it's uh, it's another Poisson process with the rate given by the sum of the rates, right? So remember that here we are just generalizing what we know uh, from our stochastic uh, processes classes into a two D case, right? But it should, I mean, the main fact should stay, uh, should be valid, right? Um, okay, so. Uh, the second problem, which is like that we might actually be closer to a base station which is non line of sight with respect to us, it's uh, taken care by mapping the um, non line of sight uh, part of the process into uh, an equivalent uh, basically uh, pro uh, process. And you, uh, I'm not going into the details, but you come up with the equivalent distance which actually take care of uh, the, um, the attenuation. Right, so th the the electromagnetic distance should be higher if you are in non line of sight. Right, so this is like taken care by this mapping. Okay, you can go back and forth, and the details are in in the paper. Um, well, this I mean this is like we have a gene approach. Right? The receiver is not so of concern. So you model things, right, and you can do whatever you want basically. So this an, this is an approach the designer does, right? But like we are considering another thing, we are not designing anything here, we are analyzing, right? We are using a scientific tool and, you know, but yeah. Um, the user would, I mean, would realize it in the sense that he would attach to the stronger signal, right? So if it sees, he would have a way to identify where to attach. He would attach to where it sees. So it's not too complicated, you, you compare, okay? But in this case, our concern is, is to model anyway. Hmm? Any other questions? No? Okay. Um, so finally, mm, what we do um, is basically that we can calculate um, the probability uh, of uh, a SNR being higher, okay, than, than a certain value. So we, we basically uh, can calculate all of these things, okay. You, we have the details on the paper. Um, and the only thing I mentioned before is that we do require eventually, I mean, we come up with an expression, which is kind of a beast, okay, equation, but uh, it, it's not possible, at least we cannot solve it, uh, um, you know, um, analytically, so we have to integrate the uh, numerically. Hmm? But still, we have an expression. Okay. Um, now, probably, uh, you know, if you're interested in details, uh, have a look in the paper, we can discuss them offline, but the more what I want to tell you in the last part of this lecture is actually what this implies in terms of results, which is probably more interesting uh, at least to some part of, of the class. So um, since we have the probability of SNR being higher than something, it's uh, trivial to have the, the dual. You just take one minus that, you get the probability of voltage. Um, and what we see actually plotting things, uh, uh, the altest probability in this case and the spectral efficiency 
in this case, so not, not the area, so just the spectral efficiency, uh, we compare actually what happens if you have a single slope model and uh, our double slope model, and the situation is very different. So as I said, when you have a single slope model, the outage is um, actually uh, a constant. It will just change the value depending on the actual threshold you set, right? So if you have a more demanding threshold, so higher threshold, you will end up with a higher outage, right? Because it's more difficult to comply with that. But other than that, there is no impact whatsoever of the density. So in this direction, there is no change. Okay, in the x-axis direction, there is no change. Um, while with our model, you clearly have different situations where you have uh, basically first the outage is going down when you increase the density, but then when the density gets too high, you start to have a, a actually a much worse density, which is again intuitive because at some point the interference will kick in. Yeah, um, and, s and uh, same goes with the sp uh, spectral efficiency. First it goes up, but then again because of interference things get worse, right? Because interference means you decrease the throughput with the same spectrum, you decrease the spectral efficiency, right? As simple as that. Um, and what is really, I mean, here we see outage and spectral efficiency. What is the common parent of, of these metrics? What is the thing we, we, we really care about and why we bother doing all of this? It's the CINR. So once you get the CINR characterization, more or less done. Okay, there might be other things you have to do. Maybe you can embed the cost, the power, whatever you want, or MIMO capabilities. But once you get the CINR, characterization, it's a very good uh, point you achieve, okay? I know, for example, Professor Das and his group has been doing a lot of work on this, and it's like, you know, it's really, a, probably if you have just to pick one metric, which you should focus on to understand how a network behaves, the CINR is the one you should start from. There are other things, but it's kind of the cornerstone, more or less, of performance analysis, okay? Um, now, there are some interesting things um, here. Well, first of all, we know, we see that there is not even a range, but there is a single base density, apparently, that is best, okay? These curves are, they don't have plateaus. They have values which are optimal. So there is a certain density which is best in terms of outage and a certain density which is best in terms of spectral efficiency, okay? So if you kind of manage to be in a region uh, comprising this optimum, you are doing a much better design, okay? And also you don't have to waste energy in transmitting too much power or dealing with too much interference. If you just pick a density which is in this region, you are almost done, okay? Because you are in the best situation possible. Then of course you might have to do resource allocation and so on, but at least the deployment would be the best thing you can do in terms of outage and spectral efficiency. So that's an important message, which you cannot capture with a simpler model. Um, another thing which is interesting is the um, line of sight uh, likelihood parameter L influence influences the position of the maxima as we would expect, uh, or minima, I mean, depending on what you look at. Um, so for example here, if you have a higher uh, likelihood to be in line of sight, you will need less base stations per unit area. Why? Because you can be in line of sight at longer distances. Right? So you don't need to overdo with the deployment. Correct? Is this clear? Right? So imagine a situation where you don't have much clutter in the environment, then with the same uh, Wi-Fi you cover a bigger area. Same goes here, right? But if you start to have all sorts of, uh, you know, things shielding the transmission, of course you, will, you might need to redeploy an access point next room and again, same thing here, right? So it's perfectly intuitive. And of course, that also means that the minimum outage is reached for the, let's say, more LS LOS friendly environment at lower densities. Why? Because everything has to do with the CINR, right? So the CINR tends to be uh, treating us better uh, when the line of sight conditions are more favorable, perfectly in, uh, intuitive, right? Um, yeah, I think that's more or less the main message here. Um, yeah, about uh, uh, area spectral efficiency, it's a ratio. Uh, you have throughput divided by bandwidth times area. 
So in the single slope case, everything is logarithmic here, okay? You have a, l a straight line. In the case of uh, um, double, slo double slope path loss model, you have first a superlinear behavior and then a sublinear behavior. Again, very much a consequence of our sign R behavior. In a sense, for lower densities, uh, um, a sign R behaves better than we would expect, and for higher densities, worse. And even more so if you consider the line of sight likelihood, right? So it's much better in the beginning and then much worse in the end of the density range. Um, there are some things to do with uh, the, the likelihood to be interfering when you have this double slope path loss model, okay? So um, increasing the density, you also increase the, in a sense, you, you skew your probability distribution towards being line of sight, right? Because the distance decreases. Remember what we saw uh, here. So when you increase the deployment density, you move towards the left here, right? So it's much more likely that you are in line of sight. Problem is, uh, not only you, but also the interferers. Everybody will kind of be in line of sight at some point. So you get a lot of problems, right? Uh, and then opposite is here. And then there is a reason in between when, you know, you have to kind of trade off more or less, but the extreme points are more or less clear, right? Um, so when you have a, a, a low density, distance is higher, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, in a sense, you would have less problems from interferers. Here you would have more problems from interferers, and then there is a region in between, which is kind of, you know, trading off. Uh, we have a, a more detailed analysis in, the analysis in the paper. I don't think it's very intuitive, honestly. Okay, I would expect uh, that increasing the density should be always good. I mean, but you know, the, and uh, having a lower density should be bad, but actually, you know, I mean, it goes up, okay? So the things get better. I'm just saying the trend is more accentuated. You see, it's a super linear growth for lower densities. And that has to do with the uh, line of sight, non-line of sight likelihood, and how interferers behave, okay, compared to your transmission. But in the main, what we could see is that, at least with this model, uh, air spectral efficiency goes high. Now, consider one thing, though, that this is a logarithmic scale. So a sublinear behavior here is particularly bad, okay? So it means that it will take a lot of effort to get, actually, a small increase. So at some point, it might simply be that it's not worth, worth it. And even more so, considering the bad behavior or spectral efficiency and outage. So there are some densities probably you should stay far from, okay? Yeah, we have some, some small scale failure. And also, I think, um, uh, shadowing. Yes, shadowing. yes, yes. It's kind of a thing implicitly considered by, by you know, the stochastic geomet geometric model. Of by transitioning, uh, characterizing the SIMR, right? Uh, some approximation in the search. Uh,